So let's get started by going over some of the basics of dental anatomy. So I'm going to start out by just simply drawing what a tooth looks like. And this right here is just the crown. And we're going to continue it down. And draw the root. And I've tried to exaggerate this a little bit for you guys, so it's a little easier to understand. I don't want to exaggerate too much that we start developing structures, or the wrong image of a structure. So, I'm trying to make this as easy to understand as possible. So, let's see the breakdown. So this outside area, which you guys probably have heard of, is the enamel. And what you need to know about the enamel is that it's 95% calcium hydroxyapatite. So I'm just going to call it that, and 5% of water. And ameloblasts are what, gonna, what are going to give rise to the enamel. Next what we're going to have is the dentin. And the dentin is not going to be nearly as strong as the enamel. Because as you probably know, enamel is the hardest structure in the body. And so, as you might have guessed it, dentin is going to have less calcium hydroxy appetite. It's going to have 70%. The remaining percentage is going to be 18% of what they call organic uh, material, which is actually collagen, and 12% water. And now if we look at it, there is this line that separates the enamel from the dentin. And as you might have guessed it, this is the DEJ, or dental enamel junction. Now if we go a little south, we're going to see right here, is this kind of darkish area of the root. That's actually the cementum. And the cementum is going to contain slightly less calcium hydroxy apatite than the dentin. So it's 65%. And you're probably wondering what's the rest of it. Well the rest is 35% uh, organic, which is going to include your water and whatnot, which is another 12%. And so, as we know that enamel is ameloblast, and the way I remember what the dentin is, is tooth means odont or odontia. And so the big bulk of the tooth is the dentin, so it's going to be made of odontoblast. And the easiest, of course, is the cementum, which is the cementoblast that give rise to the cementum. Lastly, we have the pulp. And the pulp is very important because this is going to provide sensation, nutrients, um, and sensory. And lastly, it's, it's categorized as formative, which basically means that it's going to have the ability to send a signal to say, I need secondary dentin or the dentin that contains odontoblasts to protect the pulp. So it's going to shrink the size of the pulp. Primary dentin is mainly found when the tooth is developing. And so as it's developing, you have primary dentin producing odontoblasts to make the tooth. 
once the tooth is formed, you're only going to have secondary dentin. And that's typically a test question, just so you know. And then this border between the cementum and the enamel is the CEJ. And as you might have guessed it, it's the cemento enamel junction. Really simple. Now the question is, what holds the tooth in place? So we're going to draw it only on one side, just for simplicity, but just know that it's going to be on both sides. So on both sides of the tooth, we have what's called alveolar bone. And this is the bone that's going to basically hold the tooth in place. We also have gingiva, or you know, in layman's, gums. And so, if you notice, I drew a little space right here. And that little space is called the gingival sulcus. The sulcus is typically one to three millimeters in depth for a healthy individual. Unhealthy individuals, it can go all the way as far down as the root. And depending on the tooth, if it has more than one root, you can actually stick a probe through that that division of the root or the furcation. If you look right here, it looks like this is the margin of the gingiva, and so it's named, you guessed it, the gingival margin. So now you're probably wondering what's the next set of names. So right here, what we have the area that's not attached to the tooth, or the gum that's not attached to the tooth, is called the free gingiva. It could also be called the unattached gingiva. Very simple. The area that's attached, you might have guessed it, is called the attached gingiva. So that's, I mean, pretty straightforward in the naming. They didn't really give you much room for creativity. The only other thing I probably forgot is right here, where the pulp is, the outside part that holds the pulp is called the pulp chamber. And it comes out, or the, the pulp comes in through what's called the apical foramen. And what we also need to know is some, some specific terms that distinguish what a clinician sees versus what an anatomist sees. So somebody studying anatomy would say, from the CEJ to the tip of the tooth, or the tip of the crown, I should say, is the anatomic crown. An anatomist would also call the CEJ down to the root, the anatomic root. A clinician, when they're seeing the tooth, wherever the gingiva is, they're going to count that as the clinical crown. So if our gingiva starts down here, this area to this area is now called the clinical crown. So the clinical crown correlates to what we see as a clinician. The anatomic crown is what an anatomist would see from the CEJ to the top of the crown would be the anatomic crown. Now this next part is a little more challenging. Because now we're going to get into some of the, the nitty gritty in the names. So if we look at the same tooth, and I'm going to try and, and draw this as best as I can, so you're going to have to bear with me. Because I'm not very good at 3D drawings. So, what I've drawn here is the 
incisor. And this is where it gets a little challenging in the drawing, so fingers crossed. So right here is the inside portion of the tooth. So if we have this tooth in our mouth, the side that's facing our tongue is the lingual side. So this side right here is the lingual. The side facing our lip is the labial. And if you think about it, lingua in Spanish means tongue. And if you remember from your gross analysis, uh, anatomy, your labia is your lips. The other thing we should know is the, side, the other side of the tooth. So this side, we're going to call it the distal side. And this side is the mesial. And the way you distinguish mesial from distal is, mesial is the midline. Distal is anything away from the midline. So now a big thing they talk about, or dentists talk about, are the different line angles. So this area right here, we're in the distal area and the lingual. So it's going to be called the distal lingual line angle. And the reason this is important to know is it's not to confuse the student, it's more so that when you're communicating with your professors or communicating with your peers, they know exactly what you're talking about. This area right here, as you probably guessed it, is the disto again, and now we're labial. So it's the disto labial line angle. And then the same thing for here now. We're on the mesial side. So this would be the mesial labial line angle. And this area right here I haven't really got into. So I'm going to try and draw this a different way. So now if we look at that tooth, we're only going to look at the outside. So we're only going to look at the labial surface. We're going to kind of ignore everything else. So just to give you a reference, this is the labial right here. And right here, I'm going to draw this a little better for you. I guess I ended up drawing the tooth anyway, so it's okay. So, as we approach where the gum is, where the gingiva is, this is going to be called cervical. And as we approach the surface that we're going to bite on, it's called the incisive. So, if we want to know this dimension right here, you might have guessed it. This is the incisive cervical dimension. Pretty simple. Sorry for my handwriting. As we get into the molars and the premolars, there's going to be more names more line angles and more things to consider. The other thing to consider is the, the thirds of the tooth. 
So, if we were to give a general drawing so this right here is a canine and it has a, a decent sized root and so we have our canine here and typically we break teeth into what are known as thirds So we have our first third right here. So if we look at it, we're going to say this is the distal and this is the mesial. So we have our distal third, our middle third, and then our mesial third. I know that sounds a little confusing. And then if we look at it from this way, there are also thirds. There is the incisive third, the middle third, and you guess it, the cervical third. And this applies to the roots as well. So the root has thirds. So this again is the cervical third, the middle, and now we have the apical third. And the reason this part is important is say you're doing a prep and you need to know where you're going to be breaking up. So if you were to cut this area right here, you'd know that this is the distal third. And you want to know how far you're going down. Are you going to cervical or just the middle? So these are just landmarks to help you figure out where you're going when you're cutting a prep. And so this is basically a general overview of what you need to know. Um, I'm going to come back later and have one more video on some background information before we get started into dental anatomy. Um, please use the comments below to give me any pointers, any recommendations, what you think of the video, and uh, subscribe to the channel if you like.